tenor banjo now and uh, I started playing the banjo many years ago and uh, but years before that even I listened to uh, records of uh, people playing the banjo and there was one tune that always stuck out for me, a tune called Chief O'Neill's Favourite and I used to listen to Barney McKenna, you may remember him from the Dubliners uh, playing this tune on the banjo and uh, I would be listening to it thinking about some great old Irish chieftain and that this per perhaps his favourite tune and, and he had had people play it on the harp for him or maybe the pipes or something like that. Well of course years later I learned to play the tune and that uh, became my favourite tune and then I discovered the truth behind the tune. There was an Irish man, a boy by the name of O'Neill. He emigrated away to America and he joined the police in Chicago and he rose to the rank of chief of police and it was his favourite tune and he was a great collector of, of uh, traditional music and uh, without a name for this tune it became known as Chief O'Neill's favourite. Not as romantic as the story that I had made up in my head but that was just the truth of it. I'm going to play it for you now, it's called Chief O'Neill's Favourite. except Alistair had been there many, many times before. But what made this a special morning? Why young Alistair was so excited was because it was the first time he had ever gone to his grandparents' house on his own. And he was fit to be tied. As soon as he got out the front door, he ran. He ran like a hare. The whole way, five or six miles. He only stopped once for a pee at the side of the road. Well, when he got to his grandparents' house, they were delighted to see him. They loved their wee grandson, Alistair, and they brought him in. The grandmother gave him a big hug, and she set him up to the table to a big plate of spuds and butter and a big glass of goat's milk. Well, of course, they got all the news from the village, from the grandson. He told them everything that he knew and they had a great laugh. They told them stories and they sang songs. And, well, the day wore on and eventually his grandfather looked out over the wee half door 
of their cottage and he looked up at the sky and he said, young Alistair, if you want to get home before it's dark and dry, you better be making tracks. So his grandmother gave him another big hug. She stuffed a big wadge of bread and cheese into his pocket and she sent him down the road back home again. Well, we asked her, of course, was only 12 years of age. He had ran the whole way there. He had a big feed of spuds and buttermilk in him. And of course, he started to dally. He was tired. As he walked along, he kicked stones along the road. Everything caught his eye. He looked at every wee hole in the hedge. And time marched on. Well, he was about halfway home when up behind him came a big, glowering, grey sky. The next thing, the heavens opened and hailstones like marbles started to pelt down on the back of his head and his neck and he started to run again. Well, as luck would have it, there was an old derelict cottage that hadn't been lived in for many years just up the road ahead of him. And he ran for it, for shelter. Well, when he got to it, the door was hanging off and one the hinge, the thatch had all fallen in. But he could still get a bit of shelter in it from the uh, hailstones. And he went in through that old hanging door and he went up to where the old fireplace had once been. And there was a wee nook, wee cranny beside the fireplace and he wedged himself in it. He pulled his coat up to set out this squall of hailstones. Well, he was only 12 years old and he had a big feet of spuds and goat's milk in him. And he fell asleep. And I don't know how long he slept there, but he woke up and he opened one eye and then the other and it was pitch black. Well, eventually his eyes got used to the darkness and he looked up and he could see a hole in the thatch and just then the clouds kind of parted a wee bit and the moon came out. The next thing young Alistair could see something moving. It was black. It came in through the hole and dropped down onto the floor and then another one and then another one. It was three big black cats with fur black and silky and shiny and when they dropped down in to the floor they started to rub their heads around one another and they started to lick each other's fur the way cats do and they started to purr and the noise of that purring got into Alistair's bones well the next thing there was a flash and a puff of smoke and those three big black cats turned into three owl hags of women and they started cackling and laughing like the three owl witches that they were and then one said there's someone here where over there by the fire and those three owl witches started to move to where we Alistair was wedged into that nook. Well, he closed his eyes tight and he held his breath and they came right up to him. He could feel their breath on his cheek and they were talking about him. Is he sleeping? <laughs> I don't know. We should kill him. Alistair's heart nearly jumped out of his breast. We should kill him. That's what we'll do. No, said another. Let him live. It'll be better for him and for us if he lives. If he's sleeping, he won't have seen us and he won't have heard of us. If he's awake, he'll hear every word we say and he will know that if he tells a soul, we will come back. And then we will kill him. Alistair kept his eyes tightly closed. He held his breath. He pretended to
to be asleep. And those three old witches turned back into those cats and they went up through that hole in the thatch and they were gone. Well, young Alistair sat holding his breath, his eyes tightly closed for as long as he could. And when he eventually opened his eyes again, the first grey light of dawn was coming through that hole in the thatch. He looked around. There was no sign of anything or anyone. He pulled his coat up. He got out of that nook. He had a quick look out the door and he ran for his life all the way home. When he got in home, his mother was standing at the fire. She had a pot of pur porridge on. She was stirring it. She hadn't even missed her son. She hadn't even checked his bed. She didn't know he was out of the house. She thought he was either in his bed or at his grandparents. And when he came running in, he held on to her apron and he wouldn't let it go. He never left her side all that day. She put him out a bowl of porridge. He wouldn't eat it. And Alistair always had a hearty appetite. Two or three days he stayed by his mother's side. He wouldn't go out of her sight. And he neither ate, nor drunk, nor slept. And eventually his mother said to him, What's wrong with you, son? You're not your usual self. Well, the wee fellow was still petrified, of course. I can't tell you, mother, he said. Of course you can tell me. I'm your mother. You can tell me anything, son. I can't, mother. I can't. They said they would kill me. Kill you? Who said they would kill you? The witches. The witches! It was out of his mouth before he knew it. Please, mother, please, don't tell anyone. They said if I told a soul that they would come back and that they would kill me. Oh, son, mother, please, you have to promise me you won't tell anyone or they'll come and kill me. I won't tell a soul, she said. Well, Alistair's mother was so upset by what her son had told her, she decided to go and see her clergyman and tell him the story and see what he thought about it. Well, she got her coat on and she went out the door and she was heading down through the village to go to the uh, clergyman when she met her best friend, one of her neighbours in the street. And she told her, don't say a word to a soul. And she told him, told her the whole story about Alistair and the three witches. Witches! <gasps> Don't say a word to anyone. Of course, her friend went into the house. She told her husband, Don't say a word to anyone, but young Alistair was nearly killed by three witches. <gasps> witches! Her husband went down to the pub. He told everybody in the pub. And soon it was round the whole village about young Alistair and the three witches. Witches! <gasps> that's why my cow's not giving milk. Those witches have put the blink on them. Ah, that's why I haven't had an egg for my hens for a fortnight. It'll be those witches. Very soon, fingers started to get pointed around the village, mostly in the wrong direction. And eventually, it got back around to Alistair. He was petrified. He felt sure that these witches would come one night and kill him, as they said that they would. But anyway, time passed. And like all these things, as quickly as it blew up, it came back down again. People lost interest in it. Then they began to talk about other things. Alistair was the one that stuck in his mind the longest. But even young Alistair, after a few months, stopped thinking about it. Well, a year passed, and Alistair... Uh, was a year older and a year wiser. He was 13 years of age. And this morning, his mother asked him would he run an errand to his grandparents. Of course, he was excited. He hadn't been there for nearly a year and he ran the whole way. He stopped once for a pee at the side of the road. And when he got there, his grandmother brought him in, gave him a big hug and set him down to the table, a big plate of potatoes and a glass of goat's milk. He told them all the news from the village, everything that had happened. Well, the day wore on. 
Eventually his grandfather looked out over the half door and he looked up at the sky and he said, Young Alistair, if you want to be home before it's dark, son, you better be making tracks. So his grandmother gave him another big hug and she stuck a big wedge of bread and cheese in his pocket and she set him off on the road back home. <clears throat> well, of course, he was only 13 years of age and he had a big feed of spuds and goat's milk in him and he wasn't as just as inclined to run as he had been on the way out and he dilly-dallied, kicked stones along the road and everything caught his eye. And about halfway, just as he saw that derelict cottage up behind him came three big black cats with their shoulders going the way that cats' shoulders do when they're stalking their prey. And Alistair felt that sensation that he was being watched, you know the one. And he looked behind him and he saw those three big black cats coming up behind him and he began to run. He ran for his life until he got in through that door hanging on the one hinge. He went in the cottage, he got to the nook, he pulled his coat up around him and he wedged himself in there. And he waited. He looked up to the thatch, to that hole, to where the sky was peeping through. And the next thing he saw, one of those big black cats had dropped down in the hole. Then another one, then another one. The three cats began rubbing their heads around each other. They began licking each other's fur and they began to purr. And then, as one, they all turned towards Alistair. And they began walking towards him with their shoulders going up and down. They were this close. Alistair's eyes were like saucers. He was petrified. And then there was a flash and a bang like thunder and a weathering hail of dust and dirt swept through that cottage. Those three big cats began to holler and meow and caterwaul the likes of which you never heard. And they went up through that hole in the thatch a damn sight quicker then they came down. And when the dust and the smoke had settled, young Alistair's grandfather was standing there with his big double-barreled shotgun and the smoke still coming out the barrels. That's the last, he said to young Alistair, that we'll see of those three old witches, I hope. And his grandfather walked him home and they told that story for generations around the fires in that wee village. And right enough, that was the last time that anyone ever heard tell of a black cat or a witch in that part of the country.